At this point, you should have a good idea of the aims of your research, your topic and your research questions. And you should know what type of research design you're planning to adopt. In this video, I want to talk about selecting the participants for your study. If your study is interpretive and you'll be adopting an ethnographic or phenological design or something similar, your intention in this style of research is to collect in-depth information about a topical situation. This usually involves using observations or face-to-face -face interviews with individuals or groups to collect your data. In this style of research, the researcher spends considerable time with a small group of people to gain an understanding of their experiences or their culture. The information you collect is unique to these individuals and therefore your aim is to generate new ideas and theories. Remember, there is usually no intention to generalise from your study to a wider group or population. If your study is po positivistic, it is likely that you would be adopting an experimental or survey type design. The aim of these designs is to collect standardised information from groups of people so that you can make generalisations from your study to the wider population. So when undertaking this style of research, it is important to have a group of people who can be considered representative of the population under study. Before we move on to specific ways of selecting our participants, there are two concepts we need to be familiar with, research population and research sample. Your research population is everyone that you're interested in. When you get to the final chapter of your dissertation, who do you wish to discuss and who do you wish to make comments about? If you're examining the use of iPods by university students in the UK, then your population is all university students in the UK. A very daunting task. It'd be better to restrict your study to just one university, so the population would be all university students in the University of Southampton. A research population can also be quite small. You could be exploring the experience of students with learning disabilities who joined the University of Southampton Army Cadet Unit. The research sample is a subset of the population that you choose to involve directly in your study. In the case of my iPad study, there are nearly 20,000 students at this university, so I need to somehow select a more manageable size group. I would call this subgroup my research sample. In the case of my Army Cadet study, if there is a small number, then I might choose to include all of the students. However, we usually need to select a smaller sample or subgroup. If you're interested in describing and explaining a concept, then you have two main sampling methods available to you, convenience sampling and purposeful sampling. Convenience sampling, or opportunistic sampling, as it's sometimes known, is the least rigorous method and it's not really a method at all. You just select people who are convenient for you to include. You would be using a convenience sample if you visited a school and interviewed those teachers you found in the staff room on your arrival. Market researchers adopt this method when they stand in high streets and approach people in seemingly ad hoc manners. This method is often used with university students, not because the researchers are particularly interested in the experiences or the opinions of university students, but rather because they are an easily accessible group. Purposeful sampling is a general term applied to those situations when there is an underlying purpose to your sampling. Criterion sampling is a form of purposeful sampling. It involves the researcher specifying in advance the selection criteria for participants. If you're interested in students who use iPads, then it seems sensible to find groups of students who use it. So iPad ownership becomes the criteria for inclusion. Another purposeful sampling method is snowball sampling. This involves starting with one or two people who you identify as having experiences and information relevant to your topic. And then at the end of the sessions, you ask them to refer you to friends or colleagues that they feel would be helpful for your study. You repeat this process with subsequent participants. Theoretical sampling is another kind of purposeful sampling. In theoretical sampling, 
you select occurrences of a situation or theoretical model so you can elaborate and examine the model. You might initially look for very similar situations to show that the model has some generality. Next, you might look for very dissimilar context to establish the boundaries of your ideas. Theoretical sampling is often used in case study research. You select a case or a context that you feel is a particularly good example of the situation you wish to explore. If I was examining the use of iPads, I might pick a school that had a reputation for being innovative as my case study example. If you want to generalise from your study to a wider group of people, then it is important that your sample is representative of the wider group. To achieve this, you need to use a probability method. There are numerous probability based methods. I'm going to select three of the most common. A simple random sampling method means that everyone in your research population has an equal and independent chance of being selected for your sample. To select a random sample, I'd first generate a list of the names of everyone in my research population. We call this a sampling frame. Then I would put all the names into a hat and select an appropriate size sample. Obviously, there are far more sophisticated electronic ways of doing this as well. Systematic sampling is the process of selecting individuals from your sampling frame by systematically selecting every second or third or tenth name. If you want 50% of your population, you select every second name. If you want 33%, every third name and so on. Sometimes you may wish to ensure that you have specific subgroups represented in your sample. So you would group your research population according to these subgroups and then sample within this grouping. This is called stratified sampling. In practice, this means dividing your research population into a sampling frame for each subgroup, then randomly selecting a specified number of participants from each group. A common question asked by research students is, how large should my sample be? There are no specific rules. Sample size depends on the purpose of your research, on the availability of your time, the type of analysis, and the characteristics of your research population. In interpretive studies, we talk about selecting participants until your data is saturated. This means you keep selecting and interviewing people about your topic until no new information comes forward. At this point, further interviews begin to become redundant. At master's level, six to eight participants would involve substantial work. If you wanted to improve the quality and rigour of your research, you might consider fewer participants, but do follow-up interviews with the same people to provide greater depth of information, rather than simply going for more participants. For studies that wish to generalise, the size of the sample influences both the representativeness of the sample and the statistical methods available to analyse the data. Larger samples are more likely to detect a difference between subgroups. Smaller samples are not likely to be representative. As a rule of thumb, for smaller populations, less than 100, there's little point in sampling. Survey the entire population. If the population size is around 500, then 50% should be sampled. If the population size is around 1500, 20% should be sampled. Beyond a certain point, let's say around 5,000, the sample size is almost irrelevant and 400 correctly chosen people would be adequate. For master's level study, samples of around 100 are usually sufficient and will allow you to use most of the standard statistical tests. Samples of less than 30 or 40 would only allow you to do basic descriptive tests. The key point about sampling is to make sure you select your participants in a manner that is compatible with the aims of your research. If you're using an interpretive approach, then you should be looking at purposeful sampling methods. If you're adopting a positivistic approach, then you need to select a representative sample using a probability-based method. When you're working out what you would constitute an appropriate sample size for your own research, consider your resources and consider the balance between breadth 
and depth of information. Finally, remember it is always important to research to explain why you have made certain decisions. You will be expected to discuss your sampling decisions in your dissertation.